And so welcome everybody to our open class about Edgar Allan Poe. Thank you very much for being here. It is a pleasure to, to share this, uh, this evening with you guys. And I'm Audio, one of the teachers here at A Book A Month. Um, Anna is the other one uh, who is right here. <laughs> Uh, and what you will see today is actually one of our classes. We thought we taught this this class last year, I believe, like a year ago or something. But there's the data in the slides. You can see when it was taught, and and we reshaped it a little bit to share with you guys in in order for you to get to know um, what is a book a month and and what we do and how we do it. Okay. So let me share the slides with you. Um, and one warning. Can you see my, my slides? Yep. Okay, that's great. So usually our classes are very, you know, the the the, the word is shared. We are they're very uh, people talk a lot. We we um it, it is thought as a course in which you're going to practice conversation, right? Um, today, it's always complicated with open classes because we don't know how many people will be on board, right? Usually, we know how many students we have in class so we can um, organize ourselves properly. Uh, today, uh, I decided to to, to talk more. I will be, um, it will be more like a frontal kind of teaching. And then... At the end, if you have comments or questions, I'm all ears. We can stay here for hours on end. <laughs> I don't care. Okay, so I, I, I can answer to all your questions afterwards. But uh, we'll be teaching maximum until 8.30. Okay, and then if you have questions, we can stay here answering them. Um, let me just admit a few people who are waiting in the waiting room. And that's great, guys. So, Anna, could you? Yeah, sure. Hello everyone, how are you doing? Welcome, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm Anna. Today I'm really sorry I'm going to be speaking last because I do have a very bad um, asthma crisis so I keep like coughing all the time. So in order to prevent you from listening to my coughing in your microphone in your ears, I'm going to, to remain a little bit more silent and be interacting with you on chat, right? So um, I'm Ana Carolina Torquato. Um, uh, Audio and I, we teach at a book a month, right? I'm a post talking literature. I'm passionate about literature. Uh, this is something that I have been uh, working on for quite a long time. And um, I'm a master's in, I have a master's in, in English literature. And I did uh, study at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Uh, and uh, I major mostly in comparative literature because this is usually what we do here in a book a month, right? So I started a book a month in 2020 uh, in the beginning of the, the pandemics and it has been uh, going on and thriving since then, right? And last year, Audio has joined us as a teacher as well. Like he's a PhD in literature. He has um, a PhD in literature from the University of Padua in literature in uh, Italy. And he has done his master's in comparative literature uh, in the University of Bologna as well. Um, and he is a teacher at, at a book a month uh, since 2022. But also he has he has a podcast. I don't know if you maybe have come across his podcast. It's called Literatura Viral. Uh, maybe you have heard uh, him before. And he hosts this podcast, which talks about uh, pandemics and literature. Right. So uh, from now on, I will give the floor to Audio because I really like the more I speak, the more I want to cough. So I'm really sorry about it. Go ahead, Audio. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay, guys. So before we start, I wanted to uh, explain to you what exactly is a book a month. Okay. And so a book a month is a method to practice and improve language. So our students are reading in English. They are uh, 
listening and, and being taught in English, and they are also discussing and debating in English, right? So we are creating uh, a language immersion via literature, right? So while you're learning about literature, um, I don't think one thing is more important than the other, you know, it's like 50% each. So you could even put it the other way around. We talk about literature, that's what we do, but the, the peculiarity is that we do it in a foreign language, right? So you can see it both ways. And so, um, you know, because literature is very sensitive to, to language. And I think um, this, this short story is a very good example of how many things can be lost in translation, you know? I, I used to have a professor at university that if you told him, um, I'm reading Anna Karenina, for example, he would reply, uh, I didn't know you spoke Russian, you know, <laughs> because um, uh, his idea was that literature is not really translatable and that you should always read in the original. Of course, that's quite impossible. I, I don't think I'll ever speak Japanese, for example. So, but but anyway, that, that's what we try, you know, and, and, and being able to flavor the original task, text is something that we really value, value a lot. We're going to be talking about Poe in about five or 10 minutes. But before we do that, I wanted to discuss a little bit with you guys what exactly is Gothic fiction. I imagine, I imagine that you're familiarized with the term, probably something that, that you've heard already. Um, and, and usually when we're talking about Gothic fiction, uh, we are imagining more of a theme rather than a certain format, a, cer a certain genre, you know? Gothic fiction can be theater, can be poetry, can be short stories, like, like in, in, in our case today, but it can be novels, okay? So it's not, it's not something that is attached to a peculiar genre. Uh, it is rather something more of a, a flair, a style, a theme, okay? Uh, usually, Gothic fiction is about the... And, creating an environment of fear that is almost always connected somehow with the past, okay? As if the past was threatening. So um, it is, you, you, so that, that's why in Gothic fiction, you, it often, it is placed in ruins and castles, you know, and, and monasteries and things like that. Um, Quite often, there are supernatural events in, in, in Gothic fiction, so ghosts and vampires and everything you can imagine, but sometimes not, okay? Sometimes it's about um, violence, maybe murderers, maybe different tragedies, okay? Sometimes there is even um, uh, a twist at the end and and something that you thought that was very menacing, perhaps some kind of monster, turns out to be, I don't know, your cousin that is dressed as as a monster, you know? So so sometimes these kind of things happen in, in Gothic fiction. It, it is about su the supernatural, but not necessarily. The The idea is to create this, this atmosphere of, of claustrophobia, you know, uh, of fear. And, and there are many different types and subgenres to the Gothic, okay? Uh, it is something that is very much connected with literatures in English, okay? So especially English literature, okay? So, so many examples I'm gonna give you guys now, but, but also in the USA, also in Australia, uh, the Gothic was very, very popular among the the in the english speaking countries not so much in brazil however we don't have a lot of gothic literature okay we have a few things a, a few short stories by Machado de Assis some things by Alvarez de Azevedo and things like that a few short stories by João do Rio but it's not a genre that you know uh, we have really produced a lot in, in our literature at least um Traditionally, a literary critics consider the beginning of the Gothic with this publication here, the Castle of Otranto, okay, published in 1764. So you can see that is a genre that is quite old in the sense that um, it is from the time of the Enlightenment, the middle of the 18th century. Um, 
if you have to punish yourself for some reason, I highly recommend you read this book <laughs> because although it is important from the historical point of view, it's absolutely terrible. It's, it's, it's really, really bad. Uh, we, we keep it here for historical reasons, not necessarily because it's a quite nice story or because it's well made, you know. Uh, but but then it, it's it's followed by a very important publication, The Mis Mysteries of Udolfo, okay? Um, that is a castle in Italy. Uh, many things happen, supernatural things, murders, things like that. Uh, one third of the story, um, they are in Venice. You know, Venice has often this idea of being a, a city of... I don't know, debauchery and sin and things like that. And that's very much something we find in our short story today. Um, and this this would really, these two books would create a, a mania in, in England uh, at the end of the 18th century. And they were like endlessly imitated, you know? Um, so much so that Jane Austen in, in very early on in 1817, uh, published Northanger Abbey. It, it was published posthumously. Um, and, and this book is about making fun of the Gothic genre, you know, and the, uh, and the main character of, of Northanger Abbey is actually reading the mysteries of Udolfo, you know, uh, and she's in a monastery, like this crazy, this old place. And so she gets many ideas uh, like uh, about ghosts and think ghosts and, and things like that, uh, that, do not turn out to be true okay uh frankenstein is going to be one of the big publications in within the genre it's going to create so many things you know like science fiction uh this is partially uh derived by uh, from frankenstein and there are many other publications that you guys are going to be familiarized with for example wuthering heights in 1847 carmilla the the first uh vampire story you know a uh, very nice one not so widely read nowadays which is a pity because this book is amazing i highly recommend it to you uh dr jekyll and mr hyde already in the 1880s and right in the middle of this uh passage from the end of the 18th century to the end of the 19th century we get the production of edgar Allan poe okay he wrote for a period of about 22 years, okay? He died quite young um, and he produced a lot, a lot of poetry, uh, one novel, uh, a lot of essays and definitely a lot of short stories as well. He's extremely important for the history of literature for many reasons. He's the first, the first person to, to write a detective story, okay? He created his own um detective and his at the base of the creation of the crime fiction um he wrote a very important essay um about writing poetry that was extremely influential uh in france later on and also in brazil and in many other countries around the world um the raven you you, you might know the poem anna has has read it for the internet uh, one or two days ago um is also extremely important, and also his short stories. He's a, he's a very concise author. He's able to condense a lot of information in very little space, you know, and to give us glimpses of his characters with with a lot of economy, you know, uh, and and this is often the signature of a of a a master in this genre, the the short story genre, you know. Uh, with one sentence, you're saying something, but then you're implying so many more things. You know, you have to read uh, in between the lines. Uh, this continues all the way up to the present. Okay, Dracula is published in, in 1887. And then we get like the Holy Trinity, perhaps, of the Gothic genre, right? The picture of Dorian Gray, uh, three years after Dracula. Um, and then The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, one of the great uh, masterpieces of the genre as well. Um, and, and it goes on. There are so many other authors and texts we could mention here. Uh, Lovecraft, for example, and, and so on. I chose uh, Shirley Jackson because I think um, she's not really well known. Uh, definitely not as well known as she should. She's For me, she's one of the great, great writers of the Gothic fiction, of the, the, the Gothic in general. Um, 
the the hunted uh, the hunting of hill house is perhaps our most famous book but this one is pretty good as well we have always lived in the castle anyway uh just to to give you the idea that this genre is born in the end of the 18th century and is alive and kicking up to the present and edgar Allan poe holds a very very important um piece of of, of this history you know he has a, a tremendous influence within the genre of the Gothic, but but way beyond it. You know, the symbolist uh, poetry is, in is very profoundly connected with, with Poe. Um, later literary movements in France, like the Decadence, you know, uh, uh, is also profoundly influenced by him and, and so many other things that, that uh, will happen afterwards. Gothic fiction, gets its name from architecture okay so it is interesting because the goths are one of the germanic tribes that invade the roman empire right and so uh but but then it becomes a uh, the name of a style of architecture okay um there's this one <laughs> with many details and a very high um you know with this this vaulted ceilings um uh, and and then because of this, because the Gothic is connected to this idea of, of a ruined past, of the, the, the past that comes to haunt us, um, because of that, the, the term is used in literature. And its influence, once again, spreads way beyond uh, literature to, to many different cultural phenomena in general, you know. I know you guys love coffees and and mugs and 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 nice t-shirts with a Jane Austen on them and things like that and probably that's because you love dark academia you know beautiful books with nice bindings and things like that you see this all over Instagram um and and voila dark academia is profoundly connected with the gothic uh german expressionism you know this this beautiful uh, fellow here nosferatu uh, is very much um, uh, Dracula, actually, right? Nosferatu is a, is an unauthorized um, uh, cinematic uh, portrayal of Dracula. Um, Gothic metal is definitely definitely part of the package as well, uh, as well as Gothic fa uh, fashion in general. And there are so many other things in here. I don't know, like the the Adams family, for example. Uh, you know, uh, there are so many things that we could add up to the package. Um, OK, I think this is just a little introduction for us to understand where exactly our short stories is situated, you know, because we, we talk a lot about realist literature, you know, realism in Brazil. And we often because we have Machado de Assis, we have so many great uh, realist writers. And we often forget why they are called this way. They are called realist because they are understood in opposition to the Gothic and to, and to fantasy, you know? So you have the realists that are writing about reality, uh, and then you have fantasy and, and the Gothic that are writing about the past and the supernatural, things like that. Um, so often for us, coming from the mindset of, of Brazilian literature, perhaps a little bit tougher, to locate such short stories as Poe's, okay? Let's start. The Cask of Amontillado, a short, a short story published in 1846. Back in the day, people would be published in newspapers rather than books, okay? So um, you would buy your newspaper every week, and there is where you would, would read literature. Uh, you would read short stories like this one, but also sometimes you would read uh, entire novels, you know. Uh, Anna Karenina was published in newspapers chapter by chapter. It took people four years to read the entire novel, okay. So we often, this is also very important because we often forget that, you know, nowadays you walk into the bookstore and you get your, your you know, the, the, uh, the complete short stories by Edgar Allan Poe and then you're happily reading it in, in, uh, at the beach, I don't know, or during your vacations, but this is not how it worked back in the 19th century. You had to buy the newspapers and every week you're going to get one story. So it's much, it's, it's much more similar with 
watching a Netflix series, you know? <laughs> you have to wait every week to watch a new episode. And then there would be also a certain social element to it because there were not so many newspapers. So maybe four or five people could choose from. And so pretty much everybody you knew would be reading more or less the same story. So you could talk about that. So maybe today you would be discussing Breaking Bad with your with your friends at the bar. Back in the day, perhaps you would be discussing the Casca of Amontillado. Okay. Um, nice. So there are many interesting things about this narrative. Um, we have the, the the short story was available for you guys in our length. We we annotated the text, right? We produced a this what we call a thesaurus edition. A thesaurus is any edition in which you have like the synonyms of, you know, to, to help you with vocabulary, with expressions, sometimes with with difficult grammar, you know? So what you guys read is the original text, the entire text, and you can see that it's pretty complicated, right? So we need uh, we need a uh, help every now and then. And so we prepared that for you. Um, there are many interesting aspects about this text. And I would like to start by its location. Because very much like the mysteries of Udolfo, the, ca the castle of Otranto, you know, those are places in Italy. Uh, and this, this short story is also located in Italy. Uh, they don't give us the name of a city, but we know that it's during Carnival. The city that is famous for Carnival is Venice. Venice that appears all all across like um uh, gothic fiction you know you find it everywhere you look so although it's not stated in the text itself um we could imagine this story happening uh during the venice carnival and we have also to remember that their carnival is very different from ours you know because uh, we take off clothes and they put in clothes, you know, uh, it's winter. And so they're dressing with costumes. They're, they, you know, uh, I've seen the, the, um, the um, carnival in Venice. I, I, uh, my, I took my PhD in the University of Padua. That is just 30 kilometers away from Venice, right? So, so I've seen that. And it's very interesting that people really dress up and it's, it's amazing. Like the, the, the amount of effort that they put it, you feel like you are in, I don't know, in the filming set of The Lord of the Rings, you know, like some costumes are just so elaborated that that is incredible. So we have to imagine this scenario of craziness. Everybody's dressed up, everybody's masked, you know, and, and masks, they can bring you freedom because nobody's going to recognize you. So they, they bring anonymity. And because of that, they also bring menace, you know. Um, if you think through it, Clowns, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think clowns are a bit scary, you know? Uh, and, and one of the reasons is precisely because they wear a mask and their mask is very happy like this. And, and then you're like, okay, why is this mask so happy? But it's still, it's a mask. It's, it's supposed to be hiding something, you know? So there is a, a little dissonance there. It shows you good stuff, but then it's a mask, you know? So you get this ambivalent, this dissonance. Uh, you get this ambivalent feeling, you know? Um, and, and this is the type of environment we should imagine our short story, okay, uh, located in. So, so this is the ambiance that we get in at the Casca of Amontillado. We have two characters with very funny names. Fortunato, right? A Fortunato in, in Italian. Um, the lucky one, okay? From uh, Fortuna, luck. And then Montresor, right? My treasure from French, uh, from, from French right? Um, tre trésor, treasure, and mon, uh, my. Um, so you have only these guys, only these two, and they're doing something very specific and very circumscribed. Nobody else appears in the narrative at all. So this is very interesting because it's, if you think through it, it is a very minimalist composition. You know, you don't get like, if you read any novel by Jane Austen, you have like loads of characters, uh, loads of names, and then women got 
married and then they change their surname. And so it's sometimes it's quite complicated for you to follow who married who and who is talking to who because there are so many characters. This is not the case at all in here. You know, you have just two people with very simple names, very peculiar names, almost as if their names was were also a costume you know they're dressed up for the carnival and and almost as if they had they were not real names they were like nicknames okay or code names and things like that it starts also in a very peculiar way um because he is so bitter right away from the start you know i'm gonna read quite a few passages with you guys and I'll read this one first. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. So he's vowing revenge, right? He's, he's, from the first sentence, he's telling us, uh, this guy's going to pay me back. Next. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitely settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. How interesting. He's saying that he's declaring revenge for a certain insult. We are not told what this insult is, what is the offense, what Fortunato did. It's not given to us. And very interestingly, he talks with us on the second person, you know, he's talking to the reader as if it was like a phone conversation or if as if they were exchanging letters or they were just talking, you know, you who so well know the nature of my soul. So he's presupposing that the reader knows the narrator, okay? Which is something very peculiar. And, and I think it's very relevant for the way the short story ends, okay? So when we get to the end, we'll come back to the beginning once again. I must not only punish but punish with you impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. One of those sentences that you say, Poe, what are you talking about? Even when you understand the words, you're like, what? You're scratching your head. So um, a wrong is not revenged, okay? When the revenge is discovered, let's say, when the, the person who took revenge when this person is also punished. So if you kill someone for revenge and then uh, you're caught and then you go to jail, this means that your revenge did not really work out because you, you didn't win in the end, okay? So this is the idea. The idea that the one who is laughing for last is, is, is the one that is, you know, uh, that took his revenge really. Uh, so this is why he wants to... to um, premeditate and to take care on how his revenge is going to turn out to be, okay? It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. So you have to take your revenge and not be caught. If you're caught, no, no, um, it's not valid. And the person that uh, uh, upon which you're taking revenge must know that you were the one that was was doing the harm. Otherwise, if they just think that, that they, I don't know, their car blew up just because they are unlucky, then it's what's the point of you getting your revenge? You know. So uh, he is is telling us that he is he wants these two prerequisites for his revenge, and immediately we get in the next sentence. A dark, dark, and kind of quite disturbing, actually, description of this person who is Montresor who's speaking, right? Um, it must be understood that neither by word nor deed nor action had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. So he wanted revenge very badly, but he did not show it 
to Fortunato. He did not menace him. He did not say, you're going to pay me back. No, he's just like smiling and treating him as uh, business as usual. You know, I continued as far as my want. OK, very rare word to say your behavior, my habit. I continued as far as my want to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that in my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. So he's looking at his face and he's talking to him, like laughing and stuff, but actually he's thinking about Fortunato being burned alive. And he's like, nice, you know? So this guy is a freaking psychopath. The, the, our narrator is a pretty disturbing fellow, you know? If, if you see him on the streets, start running because... This is not the kind of person you're going to associate it with, especially for drinking wine, you know? Um, we can also see right from the start, you know? So we have this interesting location, minimal, uh, uh, minimalist uh, setting, right? So just two characters. Uh, we have this disturbing start. And we can also see already from this passage that the language is quite, you know, verbose. It's quite elaborate. It's quite, and this is very common uh, within the gothic genre. You know, if you want to create this aura of the supernatural and stuff, very high vocabulary is is good. It gives you like this uh, ambiance. You know, this nice setting. Um, it also helps you to give this idea of history, of the oppression of time, you know. Uh, and so Poe is sometimes a quite challenging author to read because of this. You know, you can see here little little Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and crime, of agony and of death. Not asparagus again, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, you, you could say you could rewrite what Poe wrote with very simple language. But I think if you did, a big part of the of the idea would be missed. You know, you would throw away the baby with the with the water of the bath. Okay. Um, one very important uh, fourth element that we have to take in consideration when we are reading this novel is its profound irony. Okay. It is an extremely ironic story, but it's not funny, okay? So usually when we say that a text is ironical, like Machado de Assis, for example, quite often it, it is very funny because irony as a, as a figure of speech is designed to say the opposite of what is said. So if, if, if it's a very, I don't know, very cold day, and I, I, I say, wow, quite warm in here, right? Uh, I'm, I, I'm actually wanting to underline that temperature is very low. And I'm doing that by saying that it's too warm, you know? And this is why it, it, the irony is often funny because you say something to actually mean it's opposite, okay? Uh, it is a little bit different from sarcasm or other figures of speech that may also be funny, but but do not necessarily operate in the same manner. And, and in here, there is one irony that is often used in the language because often Montresor is saying something and what we should read is the precise opposite. Uh, but also there is a, a structural irony, okay? Some, the, the situation in which the characters found themselves find themselves is very strange and, and you know ironic <laughs> ironic is definitely the right word for this but um but they're not it's not funny okay so what what i mean by this look at his name man fortunato his his name means lucky and you know um he's not gonna get lucky in this story uh, by the end of the story he's anything but lucky okay um, or we can get this this passage, which is the first time that um, uh, Montresor talks about Fortunato, and he says, "It was in the carnival that I encountered my friend," and definitely he does not mean friend; it means enemy, right? At least I I do not look at my friends and imagine them being burned alive. So I guess if you do that, you're imagining your enemies, and even for your enemies, is is quite creepy still, okay? 
Um, and there are other ironies that are structural. For example, when, uh, when Montresor calls for Tonato to share his wine, he says, I bought a pipe. And the pipe is a huge barrel that contains 475 liters of wine. So it is very different from you meeting your friend and saying, hey, do, hey, bro, let's go to my place and, and drink this pack of beers, you know? It is 100, 475 liters. And I actually found in the internet that it could be 492. It depends if they are counting gallons from the UK or from the US. And the text does not really. So a pipe can vary. It can be almost 500 liters of wine. So it is so exaggerated. That is kind of, you know, it's ironic in this sense. Um, and, and they are going to share uh, a pipe or a cask both words are, are synonymous, of amontillado, okay? And amontillado, or amontillado, as the, the guy reads in the in the audiobook that we uh, advised to, to you guys that I, that we put in the, um, in the short stories on, online, um, amontillado is a variety of sherry wine, which is made from white grapes that are grown in the city of Jerez de la Frontera, in Andalusia, Spain, okay? Um, so this is why I'm gonna say throughout the class amontillado because in Spanish it would be like this. Uh, and by giving you the definition, um, we should already spot a few problems, okay? Do you see any problems here? Because we are in Venice, in the middle of the carnival. They, he bought like 500 liters of a certain wine, a very expensive wine. Uh, uh, Fortunato uh, poses as a, a connoisseur, you know, someone that is the tasting wine, someone who is very refined. And but it's weird that they're drinking Spanish wine in Italy. You know, it's it's very weird. Uh, Italy has a, an amazing uh, history of wine production, and he um, he talks very well in, in the beginning, in the first page of the short story. Montresor is praising the wine industry of Italy. So why would you be drinking a Spanish wine in Italy? It is something for us to take in mind. But then <clears throat> other things will follow. Because look on, on uh, how Fortunatos react uh, uh, upon being told about this wine. Okay, How, said he, a Montillado, a pipe, impossible. I have my doubts. Montresor is asking for his help because uh, supposedly he's uh, an expert. And so he said, I bought this 500, uh, 500 liters of this very expensive wine, but maybe I was fooled. So can you taste it to tell me if it's really a Montillado? Um, uh, and so he says, I have my doubts. A Montillado. I have my doubts. Amontillado, you know, so he's like a zombie, you know. Uh, do you remember the beginning of the pandemics when people went to the supermarkets to get toilet paper? This is exactly how uh, uh, Fortunato reacts to, to wine, right? So, uh, and I must satisfy them, says Montresor. So I have to satisfy my doubts. I have to know if it's really um, Amontillado. And then he once again, Amontillado for the fourth time. And he says, I don't want to bother you because I, I've seen Fortunato that you're going to enjoy the party. So I'm going to just ask Lucrezi. Lucrezi is an expert in wine as well. Perhaps not as good as you, but he, maybe he can tell me. And then he, re he replies, Lucrezi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. Okay, interesting. Because I have just told you. So he cannot tell the difference of Amontillado from Amontillado to Sherry. Uh, sherry is another type of wine. Or is it? Because I've told you guys here, uh, Amontillado is a variety of sherry. Okay, Sherry is the um, English version of the name of the city in Spain, Jerez. Okay, so there is no distinction between Amontillado and Sherry. Amontillado is a type of sherry. So right now, Amont um, right now, what uh, uh, Fortunato has showed us is that he does not understand anything about this wine. He cannot even know uh, in which category it belongs. Okay, and 
And, and Montresor is aware of this, so much so that he replies very ironically, meaning the opposite of what he's saying. And yet some fools say that Lucrezia's taste is a match for yours. Uh, so they say that Lucrezi knows more about wine than you do. Obviously, they are wrong. And what he means is, obviously, they are right because you don't know anything about wines. Okay, The, the very fact that he said he had an Amontillado, which is a Spanish wine, is already a provocation of such, source, it, it, of such, such sort. It is um, perhaps a way of unmasking this fake... Um, expertise of Fortunatos, okay? Another way in which the, novel, the, the short story is very ironic is by its structure. And this is what I mean by structural irony. It is not Montresor that says, let's go to my place to trace the wine, precisely the opposite. He just mentioned it on, uh, and by, you know, incidentally to Fortunato, and it's Fortunato's idea to go to his place, you know, come, let us go. Whither? Where? Uh, so uh, Montresor pretends he did not think about trying it straight away. Where? To your vault. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucrezi. So once again, he's playing the card of, I'm going to call this other guy. Don't worry. I don't want to bother you. I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe code with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp, uh, moist, right, humid. Uh, they are encrusted with nitre. So now, first he was concerned about uh, Fortunato's, Fortunato's time and plans. He was going to a party. Uh, and now he's concerned about his health, how, how great of him, right? Um, so no, it's so human, it's not going to be good for your health. And, and it's um, uh, Fortunato, once again, for the third or fourth time, that says, let us go, nevertheless. The code is merely nothing. Amontillado, once again. Okay, so we can see here how Montresor is playing this two-faced game, you know? He's inside, he's showing, and he, he's showing this side to us, to the reader, He's very disturbing. But from the outside, he looks, uh, once again, uh, quite uh, harmonious what, what, the, the, what a psychopath really is, right? Like having this interesting exterior and then um, being very capable of masking its, um, its aims, right? And another ironic element is the fact that... Um, Fortunato is dressed as a fool, right? So he's dressed as a jester. A jest in English is a joke, okay? You don't use a lot this word nowadays, but it used to be very common. When Hamlet walks into the scene with the skull in his head, in his hand, sorry, uh, he's, you know, the, the famous to be or not to be, etc. Uh, before he says that, he's walking with the skull and he looks into the skull and says, here's a fellow of infinite jest. You know, precisely because this, the, 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 here, this guy is very funny. This is what Hamlet is saying, right? So a jester is, is someone is, who's dressed like this. This is Arlecchino, is one of the masks in the Commedia dell'arte, a traditional form of theater in Italy. Uh, traditionally, they use uh, they wear motley. Motley is the name of this pattern, okay? Uh, and and we know that um, in his cap, the um, Fortunato has even a, a few bells, you know, that, that they jingle. Um, uh, when they get into the vaults, Montresor says exactly this. The gate, the walk of my friend was unsteady, okay? He was in not very well with his equilibrium, okay? Why is that? Why is he telling us this? That his walk wasn't steady? Because he wants us to realize that the guy's freaking drunk, okay? Once again, another way to emphasize that he doesn't understand anything about wine, you know, because uh, I find a bit annoying, actually, in wine tasting that people like uh, are spitting wine, you know? They, Come on, it's very expensive, drink it, you know? But, but they don't because precisely... It, if you get drunk, it interferes with 
with your tasting, right? So, so that's something to be avoided among the experts. But that's not the case of Fortunato because he's just an alcoholic, actually. He's not really, um, he's faking, he's a poser. Uh, and, and by such descriptions of his walk, for example, uh, Poe is able to give us the information very indirectly, you know? Um, we have to be um, uh, attentive the entire time. Uh, perhaps you know this, this the word Motley, right? Because of Motley Crue, a hard rock band. If you're a metalhead like me, you probably know them. And this comes from the 17th century, actually, 17th and 18th century. A Motley Crue was a crew was in ships, you know, when ships were sailing. Uh, a Motley Crue was uh, a crew in which sailors came from different countries and spoke different languages. So... Um, so yeah, this this is why uh, the, the, they use the idea of the pattern, right? That this crazy pattern with squares and and, and other geometric shapes, uh, precisely to as a synonym of a mosaic, you know, a, a puzzle of some sort. Okay, they get into the vault. So far, is everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. In an in a normal class. Uh, I would be already finished by now, and then we, we would be discussing and talking a lot. But um, this is a, a it's a quite a, a nice little jewel of a text, and so this is why I wanted to analyze it a little deeper. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll be doing most of the talking um, uh, today. But uh, this is not how we usually proceed here. Anyway, they go into the vaults, um, and and it's funny because it has a uh, the vaults are used for two things, right? They are partially wine storage, partially catacombs, right? Family tombs, you know? Uh, um, and they're thinking about uh, something that was kind of common in the Middle Ages and until the 19th century, uh, ossuaries, you know? So in, in Europe, you, you had cemeteries being used for centuries and centuries. And so every now and then, and, and, and often people would be buried inside churches. So... Uh, every a few decades, they would take up the bodies, the, the bones out. They would put the bones in the ossuaries, and then they would bury new people in, in its place, right? So, um, and it's not very common to have such a thing in your house. I mean, it's it's a literary liberty that Poe is taking here, but such things do exist, and, and they do exist in Italy. Uh, and they are very humid and very dark and very cold. Um, and, and when they walk in, Fortunato starts to cough, right, uh, because of the nitre. Uh, and so he coughs a lot. You see here, <coughs> a lot, a lot. In, in the... And then once again, Montresor is very concerned. My poor friend found it, found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is, it is nothing, says uh, uh, Fortunato. Come, I said with decision. We will go back. Your health is precious. So he wants to give up. Enough. Uh, said Fortunato, the cough's a mere nothing. It will not kill me. If that was not enough, I shall not die of a cough. Okay, he says it twice. Okay, and then Fortunato said, uh, uh, Montresor says, true, true, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use a proper caution. Okay, so I would be careful if I were you and I would be suspicious of people who are bringing you to crazy places. So he's almost telling him what is going to happen to him in a, just a few minutes. Okay? A draught, a, a sip, okay? A, a draught is, is when you serve someone liquid, okay? A draught of this Maddox will defend you from the damps, will defend you from humidity. Maddox uh, that is a uh, wine now from France, okay, uh, from the north of Bordeaux. Um, and so once again, they're mixing it here without any criteria um, because he's not a connoisseur. That's the thing. Uh, I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us. Okay, once again, what is going to happen to him in a few minutes? So you see, every single thing he says is ironic and self-defeating. Every single thing that uh, uh, Fortunato says should be taken, should be inverted 
and taken uh he's probably coming from the um upside uh how, how is it the upside the uh, upside down right the the world from uh stranger things um and and this is exactly what montrezar will will say once again and i drink to your long life that shall finish in a few minutes right uh then uh he starts talking about the history of his family and we do understand that montrezar is from an aristocratic family of noble background they were formerly very powerful, but now they they fell out of prestige. We don't know why. Maybe Fortunato may be connected to that. But on the other hand, he does not seem very concerned. So I don't think he's... Montresor sees Fortunato as an enemy, but I don't think the opposite is true at all. Um, and then they start talking about his uh, aristocratic family. And and Fortunato does not remember anything about them, so kind of emphasizing that they are not important. Um, and they start to talking about the coat of arms of the family, and and it's exactly like this. It's about a snake that is biting a, a heel made of gold, a human feet of gold, and with this Latin inscription, "Nemo me impune lacessit." Okay, you don't get any translation for that. We didn't put it in the in the thesaurus, I think, and we I think we did it on purpose. Sorry, guys, I had to keep a few cards on you know on my sleeve for the class. Uh, <laughs> I I could not show all the cards uh, beforehand, but um, you can kind of get it. You know, Nemo means nobody. You know, yes, Pixar, it means no one. Um, uh, lakis lakisit is to attack, okay, or to or to oppress or to damage. Uh, and so no one damages or attacks me without punishment or with impunity, okay? So this is what we get here. No one can harm me unpunished. So he's, he's telling uh, indirectly to Fortunato, he's menacing him, but in a very convoluted and circular way. Um, not only that, but um, he even describes, like, with details, uh, the the image. And once again, it's not a very positive one. It's about a venomous snake biting someone that probably will die later on. So snakes, they are symbols of uh, uh, threat, you know. Um, if you see a snake, you don't go off around fooling with it. You say, okay, caution, take care. So this is how Fortunato should should answer, maybe. But that's not how he does. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, this is also part of the coat of arms of the kings the, of Scotland. Okay, so it appears in the in this um, uh, the, this coat of war, arms of of the Stuart dynasty. Okay, and when the kings of England go to Scotland, this is the symbol they use. Okay, and it's here, Nemo Main Pune. Like I said, so so this gives it maybe we could interpret this narrative also on political terms, which we won't now we won't do today. We would need an entire second class uh, just to talk about this, and I would have to understand a lot about political history of the United Kingdom, which I don't. So we're gonna leave it aside. But just to to show it to you that we're gonna talk a lot about this, but but there's you know we're not gonna take squeeze out all the juice you know there there's much juice left um in other uh nicks and turns okay um then something very weird happens they continue to walking um he's coughing again um and then montresor says fortunato drinks this one this de Grave, okay also another wine from france a very expensive one and once again, if you're drinking a very expensive wine in a restaurant, perhaps at least you would have to do this, right? At least you have to move and then to do this because you have to value the price you're paying, right? You definitely would not do this, which is exactly what uh, Fortunato does, okay? He's, he's galloping the entire bottle like crazy, once again, showing to us that he's a fake. Uh, and after he does it, he's like, ah, oh, he left and threw the bottle upward with a gesticulation I did not understand. You do not comprehend? 
He said, not I, I replied. Then you were not of the brotherhood. How? You were not of the masons. Ah, oh, yes, yes, I said, yes, yes. Uh, you? Impossible. A mason? A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. So he wants a secret sign of the masons for them to, to recognize each other as members of the secret society. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my roquelet. Okay, now the vocabulary is really playing against us because you have to know, to understand what is happening here, you have to know that this is a roquelet, okay? Uh, so, yes, like a un dementador, right? Or something like that. Uh, they, they, they wear uh, roquelaires. And a trowel is this thing that he used to plaster walls, you know? So I have no idea how we, we call it spatula. Maybe, I don't know if, if in construction, we also call it spatula. But, uh, but yeah, this is a trowel. So it's very specific vocabulary. Um, and it takes one out of, you know, very common, right? Something very common. You're talking with someone out in the street and they say, oh, look. Oof, I, I, by the way, I got my construction tool out of my pocket right now, you know? So it's almost cartoonish as a thing. And, and maybe because of that, um, uh, Fortunato, for the first time, is taken aback. He says, you jest, you joke, right? You're, you're, you're kidding me, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces, okay? So he's pretending to take it as a joke, but he walks a few paces back, which probably shows us that he felt threatened because he, he understood, even being super drunk, he understood that it was too weird for him to have that upon himself, you know? But let us proceed to the Amontillado. The guy is a fanatic and he has to drink the Amontillado. So uh, what is the threat for of his life in comparison of drinking this wine, right? Um, and, and so one thing that is happening here is that um, Fortunato is a Freemason, Freemason. But uh, Montresor is not. But he says, no, I am a Mason. I am a Mason. Because he's deliberately mixing and confusing free masonry with stone masonry. You know, stone masonry is when you built a wall made of stones. This is, is so. And, and someone who builds a walls of stone is a Mason, right? So or, originally, the free Masons they were building cathedrals. They were architects of during the Middle Ages. This is why their symbols are all the, the tools of architecture, right? Um, and so he said, yeah, I'm a mason, all right? <laughs> and once again, wink, wink to the reader, like, you're going to see, I'm going to mention you out pretty well, darn, darn well, you know? So once again, very ironic, very dark, very disturbing, okay? Um and this is exactly what it happens. They, they, they get into this, this room in which the bones are falling from the walls. There is this, this very tiny room. And then he tells to, to Fortunato, there is a place where I keep my, my Montillado. And when Fortunato walks in, he chains him. So he, he, he has a lock. He, he passes a chain on his arms and then he's chained to the wall. And, 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 and now he changes. A little bit because he starts to make fun of Fortunato. He says, uh, now that Fortunato is chained, and Fortunato is so drunk that he did not even realize what is going on yet. So he's like, what, what? Uh, and Montresor is, pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help if, help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Uh, once more, let me implore you to return. No. So you see, now he's, he's for the third time in the short story, he's, saying, he's being concerned with his health. But now he's openly sarcastic because now even if Fortunato wished to go back, he cannot because he's chained to the wall, right? Uh, uh, no. Uh, so once again, very ironic because he's presupposing that Fortunato has a choice, with which he definitely has not. Um, then I must positively leave you, but I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. Okay, so he's playing the 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 good cop, right? So he's playing the the nice, careful as uh, a murderer. Uh, and what he's gonna do actually is to immure Fortunato. So if you haven't read the short story, I'm sorry to destroy the reading for you. 
maybe you should quit Zoom right now, even though I already used the word, but uh, yeah. Uh, he's going to immure him. And this means that he's going to build the wall, brick wall and going to leave the guy there locked to die. There is no way in. There is no way out. There is no food. There is no air. There is no water. So after a few days, he's going to go kaput. Okay. Immurement is something that Poe loves, appears in so many of his stories. The, the fall of the House of Usher, the, the Black Cat. The premature burial and so many others uh it appears all over gothic fiction actually they had a thing for being buried alive at the time you could even buy when you buy coffins they would come uh sometimes you could pay extra to get a coffin in which you could pull a rope uh, and then it would ring a bell you know for because in, in case you were just in a coma if you were not dead uh you would have to to ring the bell and people would come uh, rescue you and you know uh, there is a good reason for that. Even today, sometimes it is complicated to, to say if somebody's really dead or not, if they are in a comatose state. Isn't it's not so easy on some cases to 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 tell the difference between life and non-life. And so it it happened every now and then. Um, up to this day, in Italy, uh, a person can only be buried three days after death. So the the if you go, you know, to to pay your condolences to the family. It, it, they, the body stays outside Earth for three days. Um, and this is, by law, it has to be this way precisely because they were so afraid of, of being buried alive. Um, okay, so as I said, in our classes, we would like discuss the relationship of this with the other short stories by Poe. We would maybe talk a lot about different examples of immurement, the, its history, it's connected with the Roman Empire. It's, a, it's pretty crazy, pretty interesting. Uh, I was I was talking about the the bells in the in the um, in the coffin, right? And I think the fact that Fortunato's hat has bells, and the very last thing that we see from Fortunato is the ringing of the bell. It's also related to this idea of him bur being buried alive, you know. And once again, very ironic because people would buy coffins with with bells in order for them to be rescued if they were burned alive uh, and not that's definitely not the case of Mont uh, Fortunato okay um and then Fortunato when he uh, Montresor starts to put the, the tiers of bricks right so he's starting to build the wall and then Fortunato understands what is happening and he starts to scream like ah um it was not the cry of a drunken man there was then a long and obstinate silence so he drinks he, he screams a lot then he stops and then stays silent for a, for a lot or for some time. Uh, I laid the second tier, the second row, and the third and the fourth. And then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. So now he's like debating himself and, and trying to, to get out of there. And then the noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction to hearken is to pay attention to something, uh, being very attentive. So, so he stops working. He sits at the bones, right? I seized my labors. He stopped working. I sat down upon the bones to enjoy the satisfaction of this moment, okay? Um, uh, the second thing Fortunato is going to try to do, and then another thing that is actually the second thing that happens is he starts screaming again, and now... Montresor helps him. For Montresor, is also screaming like even louder than him to help him out, and actually to show that nobody's gonna come. Actually, so once again, even when he's screaming to help, it's ironic. Every single utterance, every single word, and every single gesture by Montresor in this short story should be taken on its head. You know, it should be turned upside down. The third thing that after they scream both together for a long time, uh, Fortunato pretends that that's a practical joke, right? So uh, where are the cameras? Good good one. Good prank. Yeah. We're going to laugh a lot with the guys uh, later on. Yeah. Let, now, now let's go. Okay. Uh, a very good joke indeed. An excellent jest. The Amontillado, I said. You see, now it is inverted. For the first time, it is Montresor that is reminding him of the Amontillado and not the opposite. 
<laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But isn't it not getting late? Uh, will not they be waiting us at the Palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest, let us be gone. Okay, let us be gone in the sense of let's go. Yes, I said, let us be gone. Let us be gone. It is a biblical sentence, right? Uh, be gone means to die in some contexts. So let us be gone could be rendered at least upon the mouth of, of Montresor as your death is imminent. You're going to die. You're, you're, yes, you're going to be gone quite soon, right? This is how definitely we should understand and how we should interpret it. Because and this is the great thing, right? Is the same same sentence said twice. Once it means let's get out of here, let me free, and the other means you're gonna die miserably. Um, and then he continues to put the rolls until the very last brick. Uh, he looks inside. He lights with with his, with his torch, uh, and suddenly there is no there is no answer. Okay, no answer still. So Fortunato is not giving us any reply. And it's not very clear what happened to him, okay? Maybe he fainted. Maybe he died of a heart attack, a stroke, or something like that. Uh, maybe he just stayed silent. Uh, I, I tend to think that he died because... But the text does not really say it is explicitly. Uh, but he says this, no answer still. And then he says, it was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. In other words, it was the humidity that caused this. What is this? You know? Uh, so I guess it is his death, uh, especially because he was affected so much by the niter and the humidity already. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up against the new masonry. I re-erected the old rampart of bones. So he finishes the wall and then he re-erects the bones to cover the wall itself, okay? In this style that catacombs usually usually are like this. You, you have like bones up to the ceiling sometimes. There are churches in, there's a famous one in Portugal. Um, you can see it all over TikTok and Instagram. There's another one in Czechoslovakia. There are two or three in Italy. It's quite common. Um, so I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat. So I put the bones one up the, uh, on top of one another. And they have been in the very same way for at least 50 years. Nobody has gone there. Nobody has even touched those bones. And then what he says is, in pace requiescat. Once again, Latin, um, not a bit famous as well. Sometimes you see it written in churches or in cemeteries. Maybe uh, you would see it the other way around. And you know, Latin does not change. If you change the orders of words in Latin, it does not change a lot. So if you change in requiescat, requiescat in pace, or rest in peace, re IP, okay? So re IP that we see in tombs actually means requiescat in pace, okay? So rest in peace. Uh, and, and it's very interesting here because He's, he was talking about the bones, right? I re-erected the bones. For 50 years, no mortal has disturbed them, the bones. Yet, the Latin is in the third person. If, if, if he was talking about the bones, should be in pace requiescant. Uh, and, it, and, and it's not requiescant, it's requiescat, which means may he rest in peace. He's talking about Fortunato in the end. He's not talking about the bones. Once again, being very ironic, like, yeah, rest in peace, you idiot, uh, or or something even worse than that. Um, so at the end of the story, we are left really with uh, uh, puzzled, and we don't really get it, I guess. What? Why? Like, what is the nature of Fortunato's insult? What has he done? Um, 
even if he did something, was it deliberate? Was it unintentional? We don't know. Montezor speaks of, of the former glory of his family. And he implies perhaps that Fortunato has risen socially. So maybe he envied his social climbing. I don't know. Maybe the insult is the fact that he doesn't pretend to understand about wine and he doesn't. I don't know. Uh, uh, we get the coat of arms that also is ambiguous because we could interpret it as the foot um, by uh, stepping on the snake by mistake and then being beaten, or we could interpret it the other way around, like the snake biting the foot and then the foot trying to kill the snake to get rid of it. So once again, it is difficult for us to understand what is going on, even in that symbolic coat of arms. Maybe the simpler explanation is that Montresor is mad. Okay, the guy's completely insane. He's a serial killer of some kind, maybe. Um, there is, um, we are also left wondering why he's confessing because he's talking there in the beginning, you guys will remember, he was talking directly to us, you that know me so well. Uh, so why is he confessing? And actually he's not confessing, he's bragging. He's, he's proud about uh, his accomplishment, you know, uh, because he has inflicted his revenge precisely on the way he, he envisaged. And in a certain sense, this is an inverted detective story, right? Uh, rather than us trying to see Sherlock Holmes catch the bad guy in the end, what we see is the complete opposite. The bad guy telling us how he did it all the way across every single set and how he got away with it. So it is, it is once again, uh, an inverted, an anti-detective story, okay? Uh, and this could be, I could we could argue, um, uh, that this is even something that is a new genre that, that Poe is bringing into life, uh, another one of his. Because if you think about Dostoevsky, for example, Crime and Punishment, The Possessed, Devils, right? Uh, in Crime and Punishment, the guy kills a, a lady. In The Possessed, the, 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 the main character confesses that he raped a girl, a little girl, like a, a child. So it's, it's very heavy and then dark. Exactly the same idea. Flannery O'Connor, So many of her short stories. She's brilliant. She's one of the best writers of the 20th century, in my opinion. Uh, so many of her short stories are have exactly this, this kind of twist. Uh, and even L'Étranger hein, by Albert Camus, um, the, the Stranger, or Estranger in Portuguese, um, what we get is also not so sick but mentally, uh, but, but also the, the guy kills someone and is not, is not repenting. And to say nothing about cinema and video games, huh? really, Jogs Mortais and Hannibal Lecter and whatever you want. Like, there are so many villains that are kind of our buddies and our friends that are bragging about uh, going around killing people all around the, the Hollywood. Uh, and so we could argue that this goes back to such such sources, okay? Poe has many short stories that work on the same fashion. This was what I had to say for today uh, about the Casca Famantillado. Uh, we haven't uh, extinguished such a text. As I said, there's so much juice left. It is very, very rich, and we could do at least two other classes like this um, to, to really uh, extinguish uh, what we have to say. Um, this is an example of this the, the kind of classes that we offer in this course, the short stories course. It, it, this is a, a course that happens every week on Tuesdays or on Wednesdays. And we read very many authors from all around the globe. Um, you have their names here. One example, um, now we're reading Margaret Atwood, right? She's right here, the author of um, The Handmaid's Tale and so many other interesting narratives. And, and we do try to combine in all of our courses, we try to combine at least three different lines of, of um, literature. The celebrated classics. So in this course, this semester, we'll be reading J.D. Salinger, the author of The Catcher in the Rye, an amazing uh, writer from the U.S. Toni Morrison, Nobel Prize winner, Pulitzer Prize winner, um, also from the U.S., amazing. D.H. Lawrence from the U.K., uh, very important guy. Scott Fitzgerald, the, the, the author of The Great Gatsby. So really real classics, very 
uh, widely known, but also a lot of contemporary voices, okay? Uh, Margaret Atwood from Canada, she's alive and then kicking. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie from Nigeria, very interesting writer that is going to be around for many decades, I hope, and producing really outstanding work. Octavia Butler, that has died a few years ago, but is a, a, a Black novelist and, and a sci-fi writer. A very interesting one as well, very creative. And we also love, we, we teach not only, uh, we do not teach necessarily English literature. We teach literature in English, which is kind of different. Uh, we are not only circumscribed to the United Kingdom or the US. We, of course, we do most of that from, of authors from there. But, but we like the idea of, global literature of, of studying authors from all, all around the globe. This is why we discussed last month, uh, now in August, uh, Chekhov in the short stories course. And we will discuss Lu Xun, one of the most important Chinese writers of the 20th century, as well as Franz Kafka, right? I don't have to present Kafka. <laughs> uh, and Ad Adichie herself, right? She's, she's writing in English, but her native uh, language is... Um, Igbo, right? She's from uh, Nigeria. So we 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 like to make an effort to to um, read authors from all around. Yes, Anna, please. Now, just to tell you guys that um, we are reading now Margaret Atwood in the short stories course, which is the the course that I teach uh, together with the intermediates and the, the English language. And this week we talked about a short story called Happy Endings, and next week we're going to talk about The Resplendent Kettle. So if you want to read her, you still have time to, to catch uh, some text by her. And uh, it's really nice to read Margaret Atwood because um, nowadays in the U.S. there has been like this great campaign for banning, banning her book um, in 2022, 2023. So reading her and also reading Toni Morrison and reading many authors who talk about Black um, uh, protagonists and talking about uncomfortable situations, very political ones, it's important for us to discuss the validity and the importance of reading in uh, the contemporary world. Yeah, we, we really pay a lot of attention to the curatorship. Um, and you, I think you can see that, for example, it's not so common that you come across literary courses in which you have almost 50% women. Um, it's not a perfect balance here, but you can see that we try, we try really to balance it out, to try to get authors from all around. Sometimes we can't because of the themes, because of the length, the novels are too, too difficult or too big, but we really try our best to get something that works um, together, you know? Uh, the other type of courses that we offer, uh, so the short stories, you read one short stories of up to 10 pages a week. If you want to read a full book, then this is, would be the course for you. Novels, in which we read a book a month, right? We have to justify the name of the school. And, and then this one, we have the advanced version and the intermediate version. In the novels advanced, this is what we will be reading. Uh, classes are on Thursdays and on Saturdays, but only bi-weekly okay so yeah we have only two two classes a month and once again the same um but but now we organize it by themes so this semester we'll be talking about narratives that shows us unexpected heroes so narrators that are a little bit outside of of the ordinary you know like there are special in a certain some way uh we started with the classics uh ken kesey the narrator is in a madhouse uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, this is the biography of a cocker spaniel, of a dog. It's a very funny book by Virginia Woolf. Uh, you know, Woolf's narratives, they're usually very difficult and not so funny. Uh, this one, however, it is very ironic, very funny. It's super cool. Um, then contemporary writers, we, we will be reading Sayaka Murata, a book about a neurodivergence and autism. Um, uh, she's the book was published in Japan in 2016, and it's extremely awarded and, and well praised by critics. And also Kazuo Ishiguro from the UK, he won the Nobel Prize of Literature a few years ago. This guy is a genius. Uh, this is his last narrative from 2021, so it's really contemporary, and it's about a robot, an artificial intelligence that tries to understand humans. And then we'll end the semester with. R.K. Narayan, a guy from India, 
everybody in India know him. Nobody outside of India knows him. Uh, he His language was Hindi, but he chose to write in English. Okay, so this is the original is written in English, very much like Joseph Conrad or Nabokov or other writers that do the same. Um, in the novel's intermediate course that is taught by Anna, we'll be talking about self-discovery. Okay, so we're interested in narratives in which the characters learn something about themselves in some way. Uh, this month, we'll start uh, Fahrenheit 451, a dystopia in which firemen actually burn stuff rather than <laughs> putting fires away. Um, a quite very well-known classic. And we'll end up the semester with Kate Chopin, The Awakening, a story of uh, um, a wife that decides that her marriage is not good enough for her in the end of the 19th century. So it's very proto-feminist. It's, it's a very interesting narrative. Uh, we will read this contemporary novel, uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, also has got some very interesting words, and it's about a, a boy with uh, uh, autism that is investigating the, the death of a dog in his street. And finally, one of the classics of post-colonial literature, uh, Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe from Nigeria, another writer that wrote in English, and English is not his native language. Um, this novel is from the 70s and is one of the first novels to come out from Africa to, to really ignite post-colonial studies. Africa has a, a very long and actually millenary tradition of literature of its own. But this is the moment in which um, um, African authors decide to start using textual genres to dialogue with Europe. And the result is extremely interesting, extremely poetic, uh, very, very profound. Uh, and then so many others will come, uh, Nyugugu Wationgo, uh, Chimamanda Dich, and so many others. Uh, the classes are also on Tuesday and also uh, happen twice a month. The, um, so this is the, um, yeah, the, the calendar, if you want to, to check it, you can find everything in our Instagram. This semester, we also started offering uh, English classes on the side as uh, optionally. So, um, some of the students want to accelerate their their uh, language learning, and so they would come to uh, a literature class uh, in one day, and then in, in another day of the week, they would have classes, English classes with Anna. The idea is really to, to develop as fast as possible. So these are the, um, yeah, the, 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 the courses and time and everything. And uh, if any of you are interested, you also find everything in Instagram, but these would be the values, uh, the, the cost of the courses. It depends if it has happening twice a month or every week, right? And if you're taking English classes or not. So it's very flexible. And also if you're paying it all at once, then there's a 15% discount. I think that's all guys. Thank you so much. I'm very glad that we've finished sharp A30. Um, that's all from my side. If you have questions, comments, I'm all ears. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your time with us. Thank I could not see going. the chat while I was talking, so be, 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 please yeah. feel, feel free it to write in the raging. chat or to talk. I tried yeah. to respond as much as I could, but then you can uh, read uh, while you have some minutes if you want to make some questions, if you have some comments to make concerning the, the short story, feel free to use the floor to speak now. Hello, uh, thank you for this, this wonderful class. Uh, it was an avalanche of knowledge and uh, interpreting in interpretation, I really loved it. Uh, I didn't understand the short story in such depth while while reading and I read it twice or three times. So thank you a lot. I just have a quick question about the pricing uh, because you said there uh, or for for what period is are the the prices? Because the... you said like uh, you can you can uh, that the, the price you can pay it once. Uh, is it a semester? Ah, yes. It's until December, right? Because now there are like four installments. So it would be either you pay monthly or you pay the four all at once until December. This would be when is the end of the semester, right? 
Uh, okay. Perfect. Sorry, Stephanie. Yeah, that was not clear. Thank you so much for the question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for participating actively in the chat, people. Yeah, <laughs> I'm having a, a quick chat. look here, guys, and reading everything. Uh, so nice. Yeah, so um, something that is really important to mention, right? We usually, uh, when I taught this class uh, last year for my short stories um, students, usually we come from a sequence of reading, like maybe two or three texts by the same author. The first class, we have an introduction about the author, and then the second and the third. Uh, if there is a third, usually we read two uh, short stories by the same author. We um, we get this ample idea of what the work of the uh, author in question is. In each of the class, I speak mostly around like 40 minutes uh, to 50 minutes. It's one and a half hour uh, for each class. And then I either uh, prepare questions as part of the presentation, as Audi was uh, also including today, but also uh, you have the option, uh, I prepare some activities on the side where I create uh, some breakout rooms uh, for you to discuss on your own. And I keep checking what you're doing. Audi does the same for the advanced courses, right? So it's really good to mm -hmm. uh, debate, to express your mind. Um, therefore, just bear in mind that open classes, we mainly uh, speak ourselves, but in a regular class, you would have like plenty of time to participate. We ask you to read some bits or some paragraphs uh, in class, so we get the opportunity to correct pronunciation, right? We always include vocabulary in each of the slides, also to improve vocabulary. So, I mean, it's the full deal. It's about literature very much, it's about learning, uh, literary criticism, but also about learning and improving your English to the next level. I've read all the comments. Okay, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Ania. Uh, yeah. Very good. <laughs> That's very great. Yeah. Thank you so much for the advice and the comments and everything. Yeah. Uh, Andres okay. asked me if you could uh, ask questions through email. Yes, yeah, sure. You can you can talk to us on on chat. You can talk to us on WhatsApp, right? You can speak in Portuguese, so no worries about it, right? We are pretty reachable. <laughs> yeah. I can send you a message and send you the link to our um, WhatsApp. Um, okay, so you can make as much as many questions as you wish. Okay, that's great then, guys. Uh, thank you so much. And see you next time. I think probably in a month or a month and a half, we should do another one of this. Otherwise, you're always welcome to become our students. If not, we see you in the internet in a, in a short while. Bye-bye. Take care. the internet. Love that. <laughs> Bye, people. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Enjoy your holiday next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.